All right. Welcome. Welcome to Columbia University, and congratulations on your admission. Yay. Um, some of you are here, and some of you are online, because you know some of you are all over the world. So those are, where's the camera? I don't know where to look. Over there. Um, so there's many people that are online that are in other parts of the world, other time zones. And so uh, welcome to those of you that are online as well. Uh, super exciting to, to see you all. We're going to have a, it's going to be a fast paced day. You're going to be exhausted by 5 p.m. Um, but you're going to see a lot. So the idea today is, first of all, for you to meet each other. So those of you that are here, that's, that's easy. So definitely turn around, meet and greet to meet the faculty. And I'm joined by Professor Andrew Dolkart and Professor Erica Avrami. Uh, you're going to meet a lot of the other faculty today uh, at lunch at 12.30. Uh, to meet our wonderful staff, Sarah Grace Godwin, who you've been in touch with before and some of the current students. And so as you can see, you are from all over the planet. We're a very international program. We educate you to be working in preservation wherever you are, uh, making an impact locally, but also to think about your impact internationally, to, to think about the global reach of your ideas and your practices. So you're gonna see in the program, in the curriculum, this balance between your local condition and then the international condition as well. And part of the richness of our program is where we all come from and our backgrounds and what we bring to the program. And so we're a very uh, open program, very welcoming program. We're a small program within a large research university. So we all know each other's names. We know maybe too much about each other, we, but you know, you, you, the faculty is always around, always available, and you get that, you know, to work with people very closely. So that's, you know, the next couple of years, the, the students that are here can tell you a little bit about that, their experience um, about what it is, the, the life in the program. So, um, you know, part, can we switch over to the presentation? So I think that, you know, I'm trying to, I put myself in, in your shoes, you know, as I think about what you're, you know, what you're going through right now and, and the admission. And, I, and I'm thinking about the emotions that, that you must be kind of going through in terms of, oh, you know, the admission process and what do I do? And um, so I just, I think it's sometimes very important to just um, to, to listen to your emotions, you know, to, to listen to your gut and um, think about when you got the admissions call, were you happy? Obviously, everybody's anxious either way. Um, that, you know, that's, you know, you're here for a check with your emotions. You're here to kind of understand the place. Is this the right place for you to make a decision? Um, so listen to your gut. That would be my only advice today. Uh, is this the right place for you? Uh, it's a wonderful place. If your gut tells you it's a wonderful place. We think it's a wonderful place. We've, we've been here for a while. Um, I think the students here are also um, uh, happy. And we are within a large research university, a beautiful campus designed by McKim, Mid and White. This is where we are. But it's something that, you know, like everything, you need to know your way around. So today you're gonna, you're gonna move around some of the different buildings. You're already in a, the, the school is spread out through a number of different buildings. We're spread out in Bayer Weather, which we're now in, uh, over here. This is the key map. This is Low Library, where you just were, okay? Bayer Weather, and a, this is where the Historic Preservation Studio is in, so you'll be very familiar with Bayer Weather. Avery, where the library is and a lot of the um, classrooms are. Uh, Buell Hall, which is also where some of the classrooms are and some of the faculty offices are as well. 
and then Schermerhorn, which is where the preservation technology lab is. So you're going to be moving around uh, those buildings. So it's a little mini campus within the large campus. Think of it. Think of it that way. Okay. Now um, there. Our faculty have introduced uh, uh, Andrew and Erica, but I'll let them just say a couple words about their research. Um, Andrew, uh, this is our full-time faculty. You don't, you don't. I maybe I I don't want to make you get up and but but. So if you want to come over, I'm yeah. Andrew I'm a graduate of the Star Preservation Program. architectural history. As you can tell from my books, my passion is the architectural development of New York. Uh, I've written a lot about that. But over the years, I've gotten really interested in the vernaculars of architecture, the, the everyday architecture of place, the, the kinds of buildings that we might ignore, but what, what give our communities their character. And so I've gotten really interested, for example, in tenements. Um, and I'm, I'm now writing about uh, apartment block buildings. Uh, so, and so, uh, so I've added that to my interest in, in, in preservation, and uh, I've also gotten really interested in uh, how buildings tell stories about who you are, uh, and about, um, about culture uh, and, and uh, community. Uh, and I'm, I'm a, a co-founder and co-director of the NYC LGBT Historic Science Project, which looks to uh, bring uh, the history of LGBT life in New York. Um, as, as, as reflected in buildings. Uh, and we have a fabulous website, if you're interested, you should look, you should look at it. Um, we're very proud of it. Uh, so, you know, so I bring all that here. And, um, I teach American architecture, I teach studio, and uh, you know, required, and then I teach electives. I'm doing a seminar on making visible history visible this semester. Um, and uh, of course, my class this semester also on the architecture development in New York. Uh, so I'm happy to talk uh, to anybody about uh, any of these, uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about studio uh, with a little while. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to Erica. Okay. So welcome everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, like Andrew, I'm also a graduate of the program, uh, and I uh, started out in architecture, moved to preservation, and then on to urban planning. Uh, and I worked outside of academia for longer than most of you are probably going to lie. So <laughs> um, I worked at the Gay Conservation Institute as well as the World Highlands Fund and then transitioned um, into a full-time position here at Columbia in part because I was very interested in pursuing research related to preservation policy. Um, much of my work, the studios that I teach, the classes as well that um, I teach, engage with questions of publics as well as larger geographies, and how this work of identifying heritage, understanding its meaning and its significance, uh, seeing how people interact with heritage across landscapes, urban environments, um, as well as within individual buildings, really influences our decision-making processes about how to preserve these places, for whom, who engages, who benefits, who may be privileged or not privileged. Um, so much of my work really uh, moves in that direction and consequently also engages this issue of the climate crisis um, because that, again, how we deal with built environment, which um, is an egregious emitter of greenhouse gases, 40% of our global greenhouse gases are attributed to the existing built environment. So looking at how that contemporary situation influences our decision making about how to manage the built environment. And please come talk to me this afternoon. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm just online, people can't hear very well, so uh, when we do the studios, I'm going to ask you to come up because apparently this is the only thing that, you know, the, the, the microphone here is the um, is the one that works. So I'm Jorge uh, Oterpilos, uh, also a member of the faculty, and I came to preservation through, you know, I was trained as an architect. Um, I studied urban design, 
I studied history in my doctoral work. Um, and all along, I was wondering, I, I'm looking for something that I'm not finding in all of these different studies that I'm doing. And it was my love of old buildings and my love of existing places. And so, in fact, I realized that all of these, all that previous education led me in the direction of historic preservation. But it's not an obvious thing, because actually, when I was going through architecture school, nobody mentioned the word preservation. So I had to, in a way, discover it on my own. And I discovered it through my love of architecture, and my love of history, and my love of art. So I, I practice at the intersection of all of these things um, in what I call experimental preservation as a way to think about the kinds of things that we preserve, very much related to the work that um, Andrew and Erica do, thinking about what is it that we should be preserving? And how do we go about preserving it? What does it look like? So how do we bring the technology, the science, the way we act with our hands in historic buildings, what is it going to look like? And what are the relevant things about buildings? So some of my work has to do, for example, with the dust on buildings, the smell of buildings, and the, uh, the kinds of materials that we sometimes look over, as well as the ones that we pay a lot of attention to. And so I'm very interested in the ideas that our work in preservation generates and how those ideas are also generative of different kinds of methods and approaches. So very interested in creativity. And uh, I think in talking to you, uh, all of you have very creative pasts. And we want to see you put them to work uh, as we work with existing buildings. And as Erica and uh, Andrew, in their work, have done, change the world through your engagement with existing buildings. Because ultimately, you get a different perspective on the world when you engage with, with, with existing buildings. Because you decide what's going to be around when people walk the streets. We have a great deal of faculty in the program that are adjunct faculty as well. Andrew, Erica, and I are the full-time faculty. The folks on the screen are adjunct faculty. Now, what does that mean? These are people who have practices. They have some of the leading practices uh, in preservation in New York, New York being the largest preservation job market in the United States. So good opportunity for you to get a job, which I always say your job search begins today. OK, so um, a lot of a lot of these folks lead these offices are going to also help you find a job when you get out. Um, they are architects. They are planners. They are conservators, chemists. Uh, they are historians. Um, they are folks that are working with their designers, their artists. They are. Um, um, yeah, I think I kind of covered the whole, the whole bit. And computer, yeah, computer um, experts in artificial intelligence, machine learning, these, uh, a real mix of faculty. So you're going to meet them all in your classes. You're going to also meet our staff. I think you're going to, you've met Sarah Grace. You'll meet Lee around today and Mika. Uh, who is the lab manager. You're going to meet her in a little bit when we go on the lab tour. So let's just say a little bit about the curriculum. So a couple of words that, you know, just to keep in mind. Uh, again, I would say, I mean, you're thinking about this program and you're trying to come out with an impression of what this program is. Um, I would, I think the word creativity comes to mind for me. Um, that the way that we approach things is not path determined. We don't teach you here one way of doing preservation, but we teach you to think for yourself and make lateral connections, to think creatively, and to think cr also critically. So don't take things for granted, yeah? And we do that through the curriculum that we um, 
abbreviate into the SLAB curriculum. So that means preservation has a lot of different facets. Okay, it's like an object. You never see the backside. Can you see the back of my head? No, right? But it's still my head. Uh, so you'd have to look around my head to be able to see the front and the back. So preservation has front, back, sides, top, bottom. So we cover uh, society, the social dimensions of preservation, who are we doing this work for? Who benefits from it? Uh, laboratory, science, technology. Uh, this is the work of bringing the building into the lab, understanding the science, understanding the materials, and then going out to the building. Um, archives and history. These are objects that come from the past. So we need to know what that past was about. And that past is distributed among different places, archives, books. So we need to know that history. So the, 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 the program deals with that. And the buildings themselves, the buildings as technological artifacts, as aesthetic uh, artifacts, as cultural artifacts. So understanding that. So the, the, the program, all of the different parts of the program are going to cover all those different aspects. The studio is where it all happens. It all comes together in studio. We're a studio-centric program. So in studio, you're all going to be working in teams. You're all going to be working on projects. You're all going to be trying to bring all these different parts of the curriculum together in your work. And you're all going to bring different kinds of ideas to it. It's very different. You know, we celebrate your backgrounds. Um, I remember when I went to architecture school, the teachers told me, okay, your first year, we're going to deprogram everything. They use that word, deprogram everything you've ever learned about what is architecture, and we're going to reprogram you. Um, and I think back, like, wow, well, how horrible. You know, um, this is not the way that we approach education. We are actually really interested in your programming and what you bring to it and how we can build on that. So the classes that you're going to be taking are going to feed into that uh, studio work. The first year is uh, the first semester you're going to be taking. This is your schedule for next fall. Uh, the first semester is all required classes. And as you move through the program, you get to no required classes. So you move from a foundation that is common to everyone, and then as you move through the program, you have more and more electives. The second semester you have electives, the third semester you have a ton of electives, and then the last semester, actually, I take that back. There is one required course the last semester, which is your thesis, which everyone does. It's your individual. This is where your programming comes into place. This is where what you really want to do comes into, uh, into place. So let's talk a little bit about Studio One. I'm going to invite uh, Andrew to come up, please. <clears throat> Studio One is sort of the the center of the first semester. Uh, and Studio One is geared to teaching everybody about how to understand buildings, what you can learn from buildings, how you understand buildings, and how you interpret buildings. So we do a whole series of exercises. We use New York City as our uh, workshop. Um, most years, we have chosen an individual neighborhood uh, in which to, to work. Um, and you know, as it says over here, this year as we, we chose um, Stuyvesant Square to work in. But this year, we experimented, and we did a building type. Um, we did progressive housing uh, this year, and that worked really well. We're not sure what we're going to do next year. Uh, but we do a whole series of exercises in Studio One uh, that teach you how to look at build, what you can learn from looking at buildings, how to photograph buildings, how to research buildings. Um, and how do I? Uh, we do a, a really great project uh, at Woodlawn Cemetery. Woodlawn Cemetery is a really beautiful landscape cemetery uh, in the Bronx. Uh, and it has the largest number of mausoleums of any cemetery in the world. And everybody gets a mausoleum, and everybody gets the key to the mausoleum, and everybody does a measured drawing of, of the mausoleum. I know it sounds maybe a little creepy, but it's incredibly fun. You can talk to the students. Uh, about, about doing this. It's really beautiful. And we go up there in the fall when the landscape looks great. And then 
we, we learn how to do biographical research uh, on, uh, on the individuals who are involved uh, with the cemetery. And we also have the Woodlawn records here in Avery Library. And you get to use uh, the Woodlawn records. And uh, if you're lucky, compare the drawings you've done with the drawings that the architect did. Um, so that's a key part. And then the culmination of, of the, uh, the studio, um, oh, we do a lot of archival work. We go to Avery Library. I'm a big believer in using uh, Avery Library. So here we are learning how to use maps and atlases and real estate prospectuses and all kinds of, of, of non-traditional research tools. And it all culminates with everybody doing a project where uh, they have to um, present on the significance of a building. So you really have to you take everything that you've learned in the course of the semester and synthesize it into an argument for why a building is significant. Because that's something that preservationists have to do, is they have to get up in front of, a, of, of, of an audience and persuade, in many cases, uh, and talk about the significance of buildings. So we do a lot of training in how to, to speak, uh, how to get up and, and speak in front of, of the class. From the very beginning of the semester, you'll be giving lots of presentations. Uh, and we invite lots of people from, from the, the, um, the community to come and, and, and hear what you all have to say uh, at the end. And then the papers that come from that we archive and they get used by, by uh, people all the time that, that are researching neighborhoods or researching buildings uh, use our, our, um, our studio work. So it's an exciting uh, centerpiece of, of the semester, which I teach depending on the size of the class with either one or two other faculty members. OK, Erica. So um, I coordinate Studio 2. Uh, it's in your second semester in the spring. Um, as Andrew mentioned, Studio 1 really uses the building as the inroad into understanding heritage. Uh, in Studio 2, we're looking through the lens of community. Uh, and in that sense, it's a very public facing studio in that you will begin to engage with community members and you will produce a report that the community can use that gets, goes up on the school website. Um, um, and you're really applying many of those skills that you learned in the first semester, learning new ones um, like uh, the application of GIS, um, how to do uh, community-based interviews, things like that, and to understand, again, these larger um, built environments, um, as well as the publics who inhabited them over time and today. Uh, and using that information, students then develop proposals. Um, we call it sort of instrumentalizing heritage. So that the end goal is not simply to say, okay, we found that historic building that still survives in the landscape, and so therefore we must you know, landmark it or designate it so it always survives. Um, we recognize that so much heritage doesn't survive. Many publics have been disadvantaged over time. And so we look to instrumentalize heritage, meaning using the methods and skills and approaches of the preservation enterprise to bring some of these stories to light through the landscape even if the original buildings or the original materials don't necessarily survive. Um, and so students um, produce proposals that really start to move um, in exciting areas, uh, dealing with restorative justice, um, social inclusion, um, environmental sustainability, et cetera. So I'll pass it yeah. on to Jorge. Um, don't go too far, because we have to, you're going to come back for Studio okay. 3. Okay. So um, as you go through the sequence, um, you're Again, each of these studios, you're taking classes that are going to inform them. You're taking history classes. You're taking building technology classes. You're taking uh, conservation classes. You're taking policy classes. You're taking theory classes, okay? So you're, all of this is building into the studio where you're actually putting these things to practice. When you go from your first to your second year, you have a summer in between. We're going to get to what happens in that summer in a second. But when you come back in the fall in your second year, you're doing your thesis. You start doing your thesis research in the fall. There is a wonderful thesis class that prepares you to do research. And then you do your, that you really spend that second year writing your thesis. And you have, in the fall, two studios. 
one which I co-teach with architecture and one which Erica co-teaches with planning. And so the one with architecture looks at different questions of adapting the existing built environment creatively. We do an experimental preservation plan. There's people that are more design oriented, but also people that come from different backgrounds that are part of the studio. And we look at adapting, we look at adaptation, we look at what does it mean to change things. If you remove a piece of material that was very important, well then you can't tell that story anymore that was associated with that material. So that's the, you know, we talk about these questions. So this is a travel studio, it's cross-cultural. When the pandemic happened, we stayed local and we did this project at the Jay Heritage Center. John Jay, one of the founding fathers of the United States, was a student at Columbia. Uh, he was uh, first Supreme Court Justice and lived right down the street in a town called Rye. So this was his estate. And one of the things about him is that he was a major abolitionist. He wanted to write into the US Constitution the abolition of slavery, and he couldn't do it. And so he did a gradual abolition, was what he put into his writing. He was also governor of New York State. He was much criticized for that, and also because he owns slaves himself. So we dealt with what do we, how, how, do, how does the material traces of that place you know, help us or inhibit these stories. We do, we use a lot of advanced technology in these studios, 3D scanning, um, we, we, different ways of 3D scan with LiDAR scanners or with uh, photogrammetry. Well, here we're flying a drone. That was uh, uh, minutes before we flew the drone into the tree and, and, uh, and, and, <laughs> and lost the drone. Um, material studies, so paint samples, uh, looking at the traces of these materials in the studio, we get very deep into the materiality of things. Okay, and how do we deal with that materiality? What are the design choices that we're gonna have to make once we study these materials and understand their, uh, their backgrounds? Here, for example, we were able to find some wood underground and we were able to figure out there was a building there. We found some photographs. What did that building look like? How could we reconstruct it? It turned out to be a bowling alley, one of the first bowling alleys in America. Should we restore it? What color was it? All these kinds of things uh, are questions that we ask. We also work with 3D printing. So once we do these scans, can we use advanced printing technologies to restore these buildings, to use these, you know, create these elements? And then we think about the larger aesthetics um, this is the United, United Nations uh, headquarters in Geneva. We did a, a here, this, this was a, a human rights uh, addition uh, to that center. We've been working in embassies, highly politically charged buildings, embassies of the United States that, have, that are sold. They're uh, being uh, turned into different programs. We worked on the US embassy in London. Now it's turned into a hotel, but we had some thoughts about turning it into um, a library. Uh, we worked in Mexico City, so you'll be traveling to all of these places. Um, this was last summer, we've, uh, last fall, excuse me, uh, we've been working in Venice on uh, adaptations to climate change. This is an open air theater that is now flooding constantly, and so students design different ways to uh, adapt this building so it can continue to be used uh, in, uh, in light of climate change. Um, we use these trips as an opportunity to meet different people, to understand how preservation is done in other places. So we meet with a lot of the uh, people that are in charge of preservation, whether it's in Italy, here we were in Venice, or in Mexico, we visit sites, we, get, we, we, we talk to the preservationists that are um, that are in charge of these places to understand how preservation practice is done at these places. So that's one half of Studio 3. The other half deals with planning, policy, and Erica will introduce it. So um, I'll do this briefly because Jorge really covered some of the kind of ethos of Studio 3. Um, <clears throat> but in the one that I, I uh, co-teach, it's urban planning students and preservation students. As preservationists dealing with the built environment and dealing with publics, 
you are in the midst of a lot of other societal agenda items, whether it's economic development, um, environmental sustainability, community development, um, land use, et cetera. And so what we tried to do in the context of these studios is allow you as students to really grapple with some of those other agenda items and to do so in partnership with urban planning students as well as with students on the ground. This was a studio we did in Freetown in Sierra Leone um, where we worked with students from Fora Bay College um, coming from uh, geography and a number of other disciplines as well. Uh, these studios are, uh, um, have been organized in collaboration with World Monuments Fund. So students are able to capitalize on work that has already been um, started within a particular locale. Uh, and World Monuments Fund has generously um, published the student reports. Uh, meaning that you, it's a real publication. You can put it under publication, ISBN number, registered with Library of Congress, the whole thing, so that when you graduate, you have that on your resume. Um, and it's important that we do this because a lot of the work in this studio, as well as in Studio Two, is built on the premise of reciprocity. We as preservationists are always looking for information, we're engaging with communities, but that process can be extractive sometimes. And so in order to develop um, collaborative relationships that really enable communities to be empowered around their heritage, we try to develop as many reciprocal actions that we can. And the idea of the report really underscores that, that we are giving back, that there's something that lasts well beyond the time we spend in the field. Um, and uh, we've worked in Montgomery, Alabama, we've gone to twice. We've worked in um, Port-au-Prince, Haiti twice, Ethiopia, Myanmar, and I mentioned Sierra Leone. So I think that was it. Um, this was Montgomery last, um, this past fall, where our studio actually focused on the use of heritage sites in filming and TV. Um, and how integrated that is with community development and economic development in places all around the world. So as you can see, the, this program is focused on places, buildings that people use, that people live in, that people have, you know, they love, they hate, they, that's, they, they, they engage with each other. We really believe that these heritage sites are articulating a social world, and we have a responsibility to, the, to that social world. I think this is quite unique in our program. Uh, we really are in the trenches, so to speak, in that way. Um, we are related to other, you know, as Erica said, a whole world that's out there that manages the existing built environment, planning, architecture, uh, the arts, etc. So you will be in, you will be engaging with all of that. As you do, you're going to be developing your own ideas about what preservation is, and that's your thesis. Now, your thesis is a contribution to our discipline's knowledge. So high stakes, because in one year, you're going to have to get a sense of what is preservation and what's missing. What can you contribute? You're going to be working closely with us to think about that. And what can your contribution be? So there's a long process in that, uh, in that, um, uh, in that sequence where we really help you along. We pair you up with a thesis advisor. And we, uh, we, we help you during that, set up what a research is, set up what your research question is, and then go ahead and do it. Some of you are going to be doing more uh, preservation technology and conservation-oriented theses. So you're going, you, know, you have the laboratory. This is uh, Michelle who's doing, um, I think that's Michelle. Is that Michelle? Oh, yeah. OK, was, she's doing uh, inhibitors of salt migrations through stone. And so she's testing those. Uh, this was Preem from last year who was working on projections inside historic places, on how to tell the story of places through projections. Um, as you finish your thesis, we want you to make a change in the world. We want you to take these ideas and put them out there, and there are different ways in which we support that. And one of those is the Onera Prize. 
which is the largest money prize in the school. It's $25,000. It's like having a rich relative that's going to help you out when you get out of school. And it's going to allow you to go make those ideas happen in the world. So this is for the next six months, it, 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 and it's a competitive prize, but it's a graduation prize. Um, and there's other prizes, tr Kinney Travel prizes, writing prizes that encourage that transition. A um, couple words about research facilities. You're going to see these in a second, but just to flag them for you, the Preservation Technology Lab, which is a wonderful place where you're going to be taking a lot of classes. It's both a, it's a, it's a facility for teaching and learning. It's also a materials research library. So it has an incredible materials library of fragments of historic buildings. And it is a place of, of research as well. Research into the past. Um, what do we mean by the past and the preservation technology lab? Well, it's, it's this idea of preservation, experimental preservation, applied to art and architecture and science and technology, bringing the material past together. That's what you're going to be doing. So it's a very creative place. It's a very exploratory place. We ask you to wear protective equipment so that you don't, you know, spill anything in your eyes. Um, you know, we ask you to make mistakes go out and play with stuff, uh, make it your, your place of research, uh, and you get your space to do the work over there. So it's, it's a wonderful place for you to, to do work. Avery Library as well is gonna be one of those places you're gonna be in and out of all the time. This is one of the greatest architectural libraries in the world. It's not just books, it's archival collections of the drawings, models, correspondence, photographs of some of the major buildings in the world. So you're going to be working in here in classes and so on. And also you're going to be in the context of a group of people who are ahead of you in their work. So there, we're going to, you have PhD students that are going to be in contact with you. There are postdoctoral fellows at Columbia across the street in the Italian Academy that are you're going to be going to lectures and understanding their work. So Columbia is really unique in the academic community that we foster over here. And there's opportunities for you to engage as a student in them, but there's also opportunities for you to engage in teaching and research and different kinds of work around the program. So some of this will help, you know, some of this will help support uh, you financially as well. Um, so being a teaching assistant in a course or a research assistant in different uh, projects that the faculty has or different hourly paid positions, you might, for example, be a technician in the laboratory. Um, uh, there are opportunities, some of these teaching assistantships and research assistantships deal with scholarships. So Mimi, for example, who is uh, working in Future Anterior, um, it, it's, it's our scholarly journal and you get to work with authors, you get to do the research, you get to edit people's work, and you, need to, you, you, you get to network through Future Anterior, which is one of those THships. Uh, some research assistantships, um, Erica is leading a uh, university-wide uh, research initiative dealing with adapting the existing built environment. This involves a number of faculty across the university, in, uh, including the climate school and other schools. And there are research assistants that work with Erica in that, uh, in that initiative. So you're going to be part of a lot of different kinds of work and research that are happening that are, that are going to link you up to a new kind of reality. And so this is part of this academic community um, that involves more than classroom, more than the curriculum. It involves being with each other, hanging out with one another, having a cup of coffee, talking to one another. And we create opportunities for that, bringing in some of the leading thinkers in preservation, some of the leading practitioners in preservation to the school through our lecture series. And we go out to dinner with these people. So you sign up for dinner and you get to talk to them, you get to engage with them, you get to you know, have a moment. And really, 
open up your mind, but also create a network. Part of you becoming a preservationist is also starting to connect up with other preservationists that have done what, you, what you're interested in. We have a number of uh, lectures and also international symposia where we bring in some of these great uh, thinkers to, to Columbia on different topics. Every year the topic changes and really a big part of the program is you know, uh, showing up. You know, I'd say like 90% of your success in preservation is, is just going to the event. You know, um, maybe that's too high, but, but let's say a high percentage. <laughs> this is totally unscientific percentage that I'm giving you over here. But um, being, being part of the community, you know, showing up for these things. Um, some of these uh, uh, colloquia deal with different things. Last year we dealt with preservation in China. We had some of the leading Chinese uh, preservationists and architects uh, giving talks. Uh, and between the first and the summer, the first and the second year, I want to highlight this because this is a very strange thing. During the summer we actually pay you to study in summer workshops. You sign up and you get paid, get supported. This summer, we're taking students to Cuba to uh, study preservation in Cuba. Uh, we do also local uh, workshops where we're studying the way that buildings decay and how that tells us things about the environment. So these workshops are a very important part of your academic studies. Here's one. Uh, where we've been studying the way that uh, dust deposits and uh, the de rate of decay on Avery Library, and you do uh, wind simulations and rain simulations, and then deal with these three-dimensional scans and annotating them, telling the story. Oh, each one of those numbers is, is a story, it's information about Avery Library, the building that you walked into this morning. We have a number of field trips to local factories, places where things are made. So here's the hot dip galvanizing um, um, plant. Uh, you can see a piece of steel being galvanized into this, into this bath. Um, different trips where we are looking at the history of places, Brooklyn Heights, um, archives. We've been, we visit not only the archives here, but also New York Historical Society. You go to the Met. There's a, the, the, the wonderful thing about New York is that we have these incredible recent re, uh, riches and we use New York as a laboratory. So I'd say, going back to your gut check, New York, how do you feel about New York? You know, that's gonna be a big determining factor for you, right? If, and New York is a very exciting place. There's always something happening. So uh, you're gonna be in, a, in the context of an amazing, vibrant culture. And those, and we're gonna go from New York around to different field trips. This is the Glass House, which is in Connecticut. You know, there's a whole kind of network. These are, this is a really interesting, there's little secrets that you're gonna find out. You know, these are the pillars. These are different stones that were tested for Grand Central Station in New York. Before it was built, they put up all of these stones and said, which stone are we gonna pick because it's gonna decay, which one's gonna decay faster? And they left them out there. So they're in Van Cortland, Van Cortland Park, and this is Professor Piper, who you'll meet in a second, uh, taking students there. Um, very close to, we are very close to the Association for Preservation Technology. A lot of its uh, leadership, CEO, you know, executives are, members of our program. Um, some of the students back there won the, the Association of Preservation Technology Prize. Uh, there's a bridge building exercise. We've won it twice in a row, so the prize is in the, is in the lab. Um, so we're very proud of that. Uh, and then we you know, have different trips, different ways of, you know, this is our end of the year party where one of our alumni has been spending his life preserving this amazing historic fireboat 
and he sometimes takes us out on this fireboat and then takes us in front of the Statue of Liberty and fires off the cannons and we all get wet. So um, another important part uh, is career support. We want you to get a job. We want you to make lots of money. Uh, so we help you along the way to get that job through first career services, but then mentoring programs. So one of the very important things about the program is we have a very large alumni network, the largest in the country. And we pair you up with those alumni from the beginning so that you can actually, they're going to be your helpers, you know, trying to sort out the profession. Maybe I'll pause there. For, it's 11 o'clock. Um, you're going to go see the Preservation Technology Lab. I'm going to go teach class. I'll see you at 1230. We're going to have a big lunch together. I'll be a little bit late because I teach class till 1, but the dean's going to speak around 1.30. We're going to have lunch just down those stairs, and then we're going to come in here. We're, you're going to grab lunch down there, and then we're going to come in here. You're going to meet the faculty here. So our, you know, all the preservation folks will, will eat here. But this was a lot of information to digest. You probably only had one or two cups of coffee. So any questions so far? You know, how, and also for the people online, feel free to turn on your screens, ask any question. Um, No questions? Do you guys want to say something? Oh, you have a question, please. Yes. No. Can be either. Can be whatever you do. Yeah. Hopefully, it's a slab thesis where it has all the different aspects of preservation, but your focus will be probably in one or two. You can take electives anywhere. But we encourage you to take, you know, electives in the preservation program. But you can you can take electives wherever you want. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the question is is are there any departments outside of GSAP that we commonly work with? So yes, we work with archaeology a lot. We share some resources with the archaeology lab, with history, of course, art history, architecture history, which are in the arts and sciences, with the climate school. Uh, we've done a lot of collaboration. I mentioned Erica's collaboration uh, with Led Lamont Doherty, uh, Earth Sciences, uh, Earth Observatory. Um, yeah, so we absolutely. And of course, you can follow your own interests in all of this. Questions online for those folks that are far away? I couldn't hear that. Careers and alumni. So alumni work in, in a lot of different areas of historic preservation. So you're going to see alumni working kind of big buckets would be private practice, nonprofits, and governments. OK, so government bureaucracies, you're going to find people in planning offices and state historic preservation offices and National Park Service. Um, they're working as historians, as conservators, as planners, et cetera. You're going to find people in the nonprofit sector. We mentioned the World Monuments Fund. There's a lot of preservation nonprofits. People are executive directors. Um, they're preservation officers at the National Trust of Historic Preservation. Or diff you know, there's a lot of nonprofits also at the local level. There's international nonprofits, ECOMOS, um, uh, through the United Nations, and so on. And then there's private practice. And in private practice, you're going to find architects, 
engineers specialized in preservation. You're going to find planners that have planning offices specialized in, you know, uh, planning, uh, urban planning, and so on. And you're going to find also um, uh, people that are doing preservation uh, consulting. So how to do, for example, a nomination, how to get a how to get a how to help a foundation get something nominated and on the national record and so on. And each of us on the faculty approach this through different different ways. And then there you're gonna find, you know, I myself work at the intersection of architecture and art. Um, uh, Andrew is, does preservation consulting. Um, and Erica has worked in the nonprofit sector for many years. So you're got, these are the these are the kind of jobs that you will um, more, you know, the, the more or less, right? It's, a, it's already a very wide um, set, but it's always focused on the existing built environment and, and you know, the society around it that, that needs and wants the, that, that heritage. Yes? Some people do. The question is, do people work jobs when they uh, are in the program? Yes. Depending on how much you work, we have a part-time option. So there are some people that, for example, are architects or engineers in New York City, and they'll, some of them will do the program part-time. Uh, but many people have 10 hours a week work, for example. That's, that's, we try to say that's probably a max that you want to be spending. And so, for example, you know, some of you are research assistants or TAs, and that those are max of 10 hours. I think the max is 20 hours. You can do two 10. Yeah, and some 10. people have jobs outside of Columbia. Some people have jobs outside of Columbia, yes. And there's internships that we, uh, you know, direct you towards. Uh, there are in a lot of these different organizations. Um, they can be more hands-on. They can be more on the planning section. They can be, you know, it depends. Ellie, could I ask you a favor? Would you mind going up to class and telling them that I'll be a little bit late? Oh, you did. You texted. Oh, I forget. I forget about the fact that you can do that. Okay. Um, yeah. So internships, we encourage you to work internships to, uh, over summer. Uh, we encourage you to work paid internships. We uh, don't like you to work for free, but, you know, it's obviously your choice. Um, You'll be in close contact with preservation alumni. We're very fortunate. It's a really fun group. Uh, they'll, you'll be working with them. There's a pub crawl. There's all sorts of events, you know, that they sponsor to bring you into the preservation profession. Uh, so you'll have a great access. And I always say it's a tremendous privilege to have this access. And so don't take it for granted. Take advantage of it. Go to the events, meet the people, be introduced, go find those jobs, but don't take it for granted. I think I've been, sh I don't know, this thing, what happened to the, oh, my screen just shut down, I don't know. Was that you? Okay, the mentorship program, again, we're gonna pair you to, with some of the alumni, and it's very, you know, um, uh, informal, uh, speed networking events of various kinds, going to talks, going to different uh, openings, exhibitions. Um, so you're going to have a great... Uh, these are some of the places where people, you might find people working. Again, this is just what we could fit on the page, you know, in terms of logos, but you're going to find a lot, you know, we'll help you be in touch with the people that matter. And your thesis is going to be a way to get into contact with people out in the field. Um, yeah? Places where people work. Uh, there's a lot of people that work in New York City. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a place to start. Um, or so said Frank Sinatra, no? Any other questions? Was that not Frank Sinatra, Andrew? Andrew is the world's expert on all Broadway plays, by the way. 
So if you need to know anything about a, like a, a line of a show. All knowledge can be traced to broken instruments. <laughs> there you go. Okay, there's a lot on the on jobs. I know that's a big concern for many of you. You know, how am I going to get a job? There's, you know, there's a, a fantastic job bulletin, and the, you know, the, the school has all of these different resources that they put at your disposal to find a job to put you in touch with people. Um, there's a lot of doors that open up, but I always say you got to walk through the door. You can't, the door is not gonna stay open for you forever. You gotta walk through it. So uh, you gotta be motivated to do that. Um, we had a dean a long time ago that said, um, try to get your food, foot in the door. And once you get your foot in the door, keep it there. <laughs> that was Polshek. Um, I probably should stop. There's a lot more, okay? This is just a quick intro. We're going to have the whole day to talk and answer your questions. Um, I want you to go see the lab. I want you to go see Avery Library, and then we're going to reconnect at 1231. And then this afternoon, Andrew, Erica, and I have office hours. We want to meet with you. We want to talk with you. Don't leave without sitting down with at least one of us, OK, and asking your, your questions. And the same for those of you online. If you want to meet via Zoom with us uh, today, please, please go ahead and sign up, OK? We'll be available. Great. Have a great time. Enjoy yourselves. We'll see you in a little bit. I'll start because it's only, you know, I will. Uh, present myself. Hello, people in their houses. Um, <laughs> so uh, I am Mika Tal. I'm managing the this lab, the Preservation Technology Lab. Uh, while I'm, I okay, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I come from the conservation world of the uh, architectural finishes conservation. So it's basically mural and plaster and paint. Uh, stencil. I used to do a lot of uh, uh, paint uh, reports and documentation in a house. That's uh, I'm coming from Israel. That's where my accent is from. Uh, that's where I also pursue my you know degrees. And to meet with us today. You see uh, Richard Piper. Piper, say hi. Hi. My name is Richard Piper. But no one calls it Richard. Everyone just calls me Piper, so that's the yeah. preferred. So big thing. And and uh, Heather uh, Hard Horn. <laughs> um, uh, also, he so Piper is teaching the metal class, and he's basically the the most um, knowledgeable person in New York City about metal. So I hear and can also uh, testify. Every question I have about metal will be shh. <laughs> um, and Heather is a um, scientist that handle concrete and mortar, mortar. Um, and then Piper's actually speaking in our class this afternoon about gas dumps. Come in, come in, come in. Very okay, so um, here in the preservation lab, um, it's uh it's kind of like I, I i divide it okay so we have the 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 what we're very proud about is our material collection which divided into two and you if you want to like stand up and look you're welcome and if you want to rest that's also okay but the people maybe the people that are close to the drawers if you open the drawers you will see that there are lots of materials of uh, you know basically what we have in the built environment. So that's marble and sandstone and limestone and concrete and plaster and granite. And what else? Uh, we have um, wood and metal, obviously, and pigments and um, pavement from Brooklyn. And it's all, you know, for the goal that our students in the end of the two years will 
look outside with their eyes on a very far away building and will know to identify that there are bricks, uh, terracotta and lead in the building that was, you know, like very, you know, like you just know because you look and you were trained to identify. So that's why we have the, uh, those uh, materials. And then, you know, let's say you have a project on uh, the public library in the Fifth Avenue about the massive lion that they have there. You're like, mm, what is the, I hear myself, Ellie. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you're like, let's, you know, you can take the sample from here of the Tennessee marble, go with it to the lion on Fifth Avenue and match it and identify and see, okay, this is how it looked when it's raw, but this is how it looked when it's sitting outside in Fifth Avenue for the last 100 years and what will happen to it. So, uh, so we use that. And um, then we also have the ar architectural fragment collection. So you see uh, many types of fragments, you see concrete, you see uh, terracotta here from Chicago, um, you see some metal from downtown over there. So we're gonna, so this is, you know, each sample, we know where it's from, you know, more or less exactly where it's from. They want you to something like this. <laughs> and she doesn't say, what is this junk? <laughs> and when you say to her, this is a piece of town, it's made entirely with oyster shells, lime from burnt oyster shells and, and oyster shell disaggregate, she says, oh, it's wonderful. We'll have to just put it in the, in the collection. So she's really patient with us. And I'm always astounded that those large zinc pavilion ones in there, this is a, a small version of one haven't been thrown out because they're too big and they're sitting on the floor. They're over in that corner there. She's really very patient with us because each of these pieces tells a story and she's willing to listen to the story. I like the stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's the material part. And then the second part will be the technology that we're very much putting our, you know, uh, art and on it we have uh so because the commentation is a big part of the um, of the of the preservation work i think why are you guys so it's just the volumes there? on over there sorry um so can you please it won't be able to come to um so uh, i will just share with you some of the things that we have. So we have a thermal camera, we have a very expensive uh, SLR camera. We have a scanner, a 3D scanner that can scan you know, in those models that I put outside and then you can, you can look at it after. Um, and we have a small scanner that can scan fragments and this is how I did that. You can pass it around. By the way, you can touch everything and you can Plastic, so that plastic white thing. So we scan this sample. We can take it. Um, so you scan this, and then you have this. Now, what do you do with this? I don't know, but <laughs> but we, you know, we experiment. You no, know, we play, we try. And if it's, you know, if it's really nothing, then, you know, it's aesthetic. It's nice that we can do this. Again, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do with it, but someone will one day, and that's where we're here. Um, and uh, what else? Oh, and we have um, XRF, which is pretty amazing. So you see that those samples over there, that's a uh, um that, was, that is done by Dana Lieber, the second year student. And she brought samples uh, from, uh, a campus in Jerusalem, and she brought them here, and she's testing each of the sample with the XRF. So the XRF is basically a very smart gun that shoots radiation. And when the radiation hits the sample, it breaks it and bring it back to the to the uh, to us, uh, you know, common people, and <laughs> we can see the elements uh, that. Is in so she's checking them in the review. Um, and she also have results 
from the quarries in Jerusalem from where this stones were taken so she can do, you know, like, um, let's see. Comparison. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then there is another thing who's here, and we're very lucky to, that she's here today with us. Thank you, Michelle. I think my name you can tell me. You can take this slide, share. Screen first. Yeah, yeah, please stay here. So, Michelle is a second year almost graduate. I'm great. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at salt damage to porous building materials, and I focus on stone. Um, and there's been these compounds that have been identified to try and prevent stone damage to stone because of uh, salts. And so here I have some of my controls and some of my treated samples. Um, doing accelerated weathering for wet dry cycles and salts was really, really hard. And that was kind of the crux of this thesis. Um, but there's some stones over there that were um, exposed to salts, and I have used desalination techniques to try and remove them. Um, there's been samples that were sitting in salts for days at a time um, to see how they would weather that way. Uh, yeah, that's. Um, we also have Jenny Hoffman, who is a student of Michelle Hoffman, who is Taken, so we like you know. That's the thing that we're doing here and are interesting for us. And of course, for the, it's a uh, it's glass. We're taking here the classes that are the material based classes. And for physics in your second year, if you are into material, the lab is kind of the only support system. So and, and by the lab, it's the <laughs> And you know we 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 slash I this one um, like for the students that are uh, my assistant here are doing you know whatever we can. And an important thing, maybe the most important thing that we have here is our lab assistant, which is Ellie and Hila. Where are you met? Hila, are you here? Okay. So Hila and Ellie, and uh, they are you know. Every year I have one open position for first year and two for second year. And um, and it's been amazing always to, to have uh, you working with me and they do so much here. <laughs> um, you know, everything you see, you know, the organization, the material, the, like the helping with Hila was helping uh, yesterday to the first year to scan. So they're like my, you know, um, they, 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 they're a big part of this lab. And if anyone is interested in, um, to work with me next year, I will mean, send the position for um, probably the end of the year. <laughs> Last year, next year. 